Hey, everyone. It's me. My computer works, I think. I hope. I don't know. Uh, how is everyone? First day? Having fun? Yeah? Hell yeah. All right. Uh, now, are we all excited to talk about authentication again? Excellent. That is the correct answer. This is a very, very boring topic, but it is very, very important. Uh, Rob just did a really good session on this stuff. Um, I'm hopefully going to help out a little bit on basically the groundwork that he laid. We're going to get into some more advanced stuff. Um, as I said, this is very, very dull. I know everyone's probably flagged and they all just want a beer. So the best way we can all get through this is questions. Okay, so just raise your hands, ask as many questions as possible. I'm probably not going to be able to answer most of this stuff. Um, I uh, know a little bit about it, but there's people in at this conference, Emmanuel's uh, one of them, who know this stuff way better than me. So find Emmanuel after this and go and annoy him about it because he he's most of the stuff in my slide deck comes from him. Um, okay, so today's session, PowerShell loves Microsoft authentication. Uh, almost everything you need to know about Azure authentication. It's important that I put that almost there because there is so much to know about this stuff that I'm primarily just focused on what you're going to need in your day-to-day. -day. So as a, an IT admin, as a consultant, as someone working just on little tools that you're going to use internally or big tools that you're going to give to your clients, the stuff that we're going to talk about today hopefully will help you with that. Um, just a show of hands, who's currently working with PowerShell building functions or you know Azure apps and stuff right now today in their day job. Okay. If I asked that question last year, there would have been about half as many people. So it's really, really cool to see the adoption rate of this sort of stuff. Um, so that's that's awesome. All right. Very quickly, sponsors. Thank you very much to Chocolatey, Centrino, Script Runner, and I don't know who Patch My PC is, but I'm sure they're very nice people. Somehow they pay me, so I don't know. They, they could be questionable. Uh, so about me, in case anyone doesn't know, hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I didn't like my profile picture, so this is my cat, Preston. Uh, I am a code monkey at Patch My PC, so again, somehow I tricked them into giving me a job, and now I write cool stuff to automate things with Intune and, and Config Manager. Uh, you can find me on all the things, uh, Twitter, while it's still around. Uh, I have my own blog, uh, and I put everything, including this code, up on GitHub, so just follow that, um, and you'll be able to sort of get all this fun stuff. Okay, now, it's 4-ish p.m. It's time for Death by Slides. I really wish it didn't finish there. Anyway, no, I promise you this won't be uh, slide heavy. We're going to get in, we're going to do a bunch of uh, demos. Uh, hopefully they work. Again, I sort of challenged myself to uh, a project I'm currently working on. I promised that it would work on any platform at all. And to confirm that, I bought a Mac. I don't like Macs. This is the only thing I use when I travel now. So let's see if the code fails or not. Um, OK, so quick summary about what we're going to go through. So as I said, you know, huge amount of people are currently working in Azure, doing powershell -y things. Um, just a show of hands, for the people that aren't doing this stuff, or even the people that are, was authentication a really big hurdle for you to sort of get into figuring out how to do this stuff? Yeah? OK. So most people, when they're just initially getting into working with PowerShell or other languages or anything, uh, they go, OK, cool. I'm going to write this cool thing. It works on my machine. I'm going to chuck it up into Azure, and I'm just going to see how it works. And then they go, oh, I've got to figure out this auth thing. Um, there's lots of documentation, but there's just so much about authentication that it's really difficult to sort of start that process. And until you get really comfortable with it, it can seem like a really daunting task. So I feel like it's a big uh, barrier to more people getting in and playing around with this stuff. So one of the key reasons why I'm talking about this stuff and hopefully all the other authentication sessions we're doing is that if we can collectively bring ourselves to the same level, then we can stop talking about this very boring topic. Um, we can get onto more fun things. I think that's kind of the goal with PowerShell, right? If we can automate out the annoying things, then we can focus on more fun things, and we can start providing value to our business and having fun at work uh, as much as you can. Um, so you know, on that, what tools exist to make authentication not seem hard? We'll go through a couple of those, um, and then we're going to dive into an auth token. Uh, Rob did a really sort of, I glanced at a little bit of what he was doing there, so we might not even need to go too much into that, um, but we'll see. Um, and then uh, just go through a couple of different scenarios here. So we're going to look at uh, device code authentication, um, how we can authenticate without a password, using client secrets, certificates. And then finally, we're just going to get rid of authentication as a concept altogether 
and we're just going to look at managed identities, which is the thing that we all should be using if we're specifically working in Azure. Um, I've got this extra credit thing here. I have a really, really stupid script that I wrote to prove someone wrong. We can look at that uh, if, we, if we have time. Um, OK, so let's get right into it. Most importantly, as I said, the, the initial stage of doing authentication seems daunting because if you read the docs and you're not going like, to use other people's code to help you, which you should be, uh, then it is a very daunting process. So there's a bunch of things that you have to have on your machine right now if this is a, you know, an intro into authentication that will make your life better. This entire session is a love letter to the mcell.ps module. It makes authentication a non-starting conversation. It is the easiest thing in the world. You don't need to know how it works. If you want to, you can, and we can talk about it after this session. But mcell ps is the magic. Uh, obviously, obviously, everyone's using VS Code and Windows Terminal for all of their Devi, you know, day-to-day -day BAU work. So we don't need to get into that. And and finally, obviously, PowerShell Seven because it's 2023 and we're not using Five right anymore. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, and that's it. That's all we need. So something to write our code in. It doesn't have to be VS Code. You can use Notepad++ if you really have to. Uh, you don't need Windows Terminal. But these things make our lives easier. And that is, again, the, the primary goal of everything I talk about. I don't want to do this stuff. I just want it to happen. So these things help us. OK. Slides done. Session done. How long have I got? 37. No, I still have to talk. OK. So OK. Let's look into basic authentication. This is. Ignoring the prereqs that I just said that make our life easier, I'm going to use a couple of them, but like, how would you get around doing like an initial concept of authentication? You know, the, the auth dance that we're all used to doing is you go to a website, you put your username and your password in, you hit enter, and then you're in the system. Maybe you need to do a little bit of, you know, MFA dancing and all that sort of nonsense, but like, surely it's that simple. This is called raw dogging the internet. Or resource owner password credentials grants, which is, uh, doesn't really roll off the tongue the same way. But functionally, what we're going to do is, if I can get this working, I cannot. Let me just exit out of this. I was kind of hoping I could do that, but whatever. Everyone can see that? OK. So we're going to go into my script here, rawdog.ps1. OK. I got these things. I got uh, basically what we're going to do is we're just going to treat that process of going to a website and putting in a username and a password, and we are going to replicate that experience. Don't do this because your password is in plain text. And when you send those requests, they are cached. People can get access to it. This is why this is very bad. And you should, you should use protection when you're doing authentication because you don't want to get in trouble. OK, so well, let me just uh, put my little clicky guy down. I'm going to hit F8. OK, I've loaded in all my secrets. I'm not using secret management because I'm a terrible, terrible human being. Let's have a look here. What we're essentially doing is we're building the URL uh, that, that grants us the request for, uh, for an auth token. Um, so we're literally in the URL string. We're saying, hey, my name is Ben. My password is this. Please give me a token. That's why this is bad, right? OK, so what we're looking at here, I want to authenticate to graph. This can apply to anything in Azure, but Graph is the thing that I primarily work with. So we're going to authenticate. I want a token for Graph because I want to get the list of all the users in my organization. Um, I have a client ID or an app ID that is stored. This is just an app registration. Hand up who doesn't know what app registrations are at this point. No one. Excellent. I don't have to go through that. Next one is the grant type. So we, at, the, at the moment, we're doing a password authentication, right? I'm, I'm literally saying username and password. Can, can you please give me access? What is my username? What is the scope? I'm doing an open ID based authentication process. Finally, my password, which is stored in a variable uh, so that no one can see it, obviously. Um, finally, we're just doing a, a very basic request. So invoke REST method. We're doing a post because we're sending a payload of data to a service to ask for a token. Uh, that is login.microsoftonline.com putting into my, uh, my environment or my tenant, because this is not a multi-tenant uh, application registration, hitting OAuth2 and token. Uh, the body of the request is just the request body. It's just that payload that we're looking at that kind of looks like a splattered uh, request. And we're just going to go ahead. Let me shrink all this down. And I'm just going to yeet this out into the world. OK, now, 
Ignore the fact that I've got a token because that's pre-canned. The error that I got here, can everyone see that? So due to a configuration change made by your administrator or because you uh, moved to a new location, you must use multi-factor authentication to access this. So immediately, my company's policy or powershell.com's policy has stopped me from being an idiot and putting my password into the world. So if I didn't have MFA and everyone is using MFA, it's 2023, uh, you can't do this. And that's good. You're not supposed to do this uh, authentication dance. Now, MFA saves us in that scenario, but what if we were like, no, 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 no. I want to be really uh, uh, brutally aggressive with finding my mouse, uh, with getting uh, using this uh, flow for authentication, so I'm just going to use the client secret. Okay, so how, how does this look? So again, we've got the resource, we've got our client ID, and then we have a client secret. The grant type this time, instead of uh, password, is client credentials. So I'm generating the request, app ID, secret, client credentials, and the scope is open ID. Exactly the same request. When I run this, I don't get an error. I get my token. So I have uh, very dangerously now sent out a request to the internet that anyone could just monitor. Uh, they now know my client's secret, so they can authenticate and they can do things in my environment. This is very bad. There's, there's a reason that you should not do this. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. This is the wrong way to do things. Everything moving forward is the good way to do things. So don't do this. Don't take photos of this and copy it. It's very bad. Okay, so let's go back to my thing. Slideshow. Play from current slide. Let's just look at that GIF for a quick second. Isn't that lovely? Okay. All right, so interactive authentication. So we're going to, again, we're going to leverage that msal.ps module that I was talking about that I absolutely love. Uh, and we're going to use that to save uh, us from doing terrible things in PowerShell because we can do bad things in PowerShell. Um, so we're all going to look happy. And look at that. He's got a Mac. He's obviously me. Uh, okay, so let's pop back out of this. Again, not death by slides. Okay, we are going to go into not raw dog because this is the correct way to do things. Shrink this down. Okay, again, I'm just going to load in my secrets because I'm not using a management platform because I'm terrible. And I'm just going to drop token equals no. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do an interactive authentication using the msal request. So essentially what this is doing is it is creating the request for a token, and then it is swapping that out for an access token. Uh, so that it, it does all the work for us so that we can just get the thing, the access token that we need so we can move on. Um, I don't have examples on this machine right now, but you can absolutely uh, leverage the msal libraries manually and write a very, very big script to create either a public client or a confidential client app um, and do this sort of stuff manually without msal. But the point here is that sometimes we can leverage the work of others to make our jobs easier. So you can see the request here. I didn't really need to even splat this out. This is just three requests. I'm saying my client ID is the client ID that I'm using. The tenant ID is my tenant. And I'm saying, hey, I want this to be interactive. So I'm just going to go ahead. I'm just going to run this, and we're going to see what happens. Whoop, it bounces me across. It's asking me to sign in. Uh, my background is still the 2019 Powers Hell logo, which is cool. Uh, and we're just going to sign in. OK, authentication complete. You can return. Um, on a Windows device, sometimes this can actually return you back to the client, but for some reason, it's not working here. Um, let's have a quick look. OK, so we've now got our ID token, which is basically who I am. So when you do an interactive authentication, you get two things. Uh, you get the access token, which is the thing that you use in your scripts moving forward to get access to things. But because we logged in interactively, we also have an identity token that we can actually use to verify that we're who we are. Um, they're very similar. They're all just base64 encoded strings of data. Um, but you, you essentially will probably never ever use the ID token, but it's there and it's, and it's handy. Um, we can see a whole bunch of stuff. We can look in. Uh, one of the cool things that you get with msal.ps, because again, this is just a love letter to msal.ps, 
is this giant chunk of object data that we get actually, so instead of going to jwt.io, which is everyone's favorite thing to look at a uh, uh, decoded uh, JWT token, you could also uh, just use mCell and you can look at the necessary things that you generally want. So let's have a look at this giant wall of text because we all love this. So we can see here right now, I've got a unique idea of my request. Uh, do I have an extended lifetime token? No, I don't because I don't need that. I've got my expiration date, my extended expires on, my tenant ID, uh, my account, basically just the raw data of who I am and what I'm trying to authenticate to. Uh, but then if we have a look down here, we've also got access to the scopes. So the scopes are the things that, uh, because I've authenticated to this, what am I actually allowed to do? So these are the permissions. Now, normally to look at this, you would need to decode the JWT token, uh, which is easy. You can do it in like four lines of code. Uh, or with mCell, you can literally just say token scopes. And I can see, cool, I authenticated with profile, open ID, email, and user read and default. This is a very basic application. It's not really going to do too much. But functionally, this is just showing me what I'm actually allowed to do, uh, which I just think is fantastic because it means that, um, as I said, it's easy to do, but now I don't have to do it. So it just makes my life easier. OK, so that is interactive authentication. I'm just going to quickly go back to my slides because I don't know what comes next because I'm prepared. And I just opened Visual Studio, so that'll be good. Go away. Okay, let's go back here. Slideshow, play from current slide. No, device code. I'm going to show you one more thing before we get to this. Okay. Ignore the GIF. You didn't see it. It's very funny. Okay, so... When I showed you the thing not to do, I showed you an interactive way to authenticate that failed because I have MFA set up because I'm a very responsible uh, uh, organizer of my organization. Uh, and then I also showed you the way that you can sort of bypass that because I'm using a client secret. So we hopefully I've shown you that mcell.ps, I love it. Uh, interactive authentication is very simple. It's three commands. Um, if we want to do it with a client secret, it's exactly the same. So if I go to... Get MCL token. Where is it? Region interactive. Did it not save? No, here we go. Okay, so region, non interactive authentication. Uh, this is a little comment for me, broken on purpose. Don't freak out, Ben. I like to t give myself little, uh, you know, nice things uh, when I'm looking back at my stuff. Okay, so I've got a client ID, I've got a tenant ID, and I've got a client secret. Again, it's all hidden in environment variables so that I'm not showing the world my stuff. Uh, but I will right now, just, you just wait and see. So I'm not changing anything other than saying, uh, hey, don't make this interactive. I'm going to chuck a client secret in there. So uh, MCell is smart enough to know that the way that I'm crafting this specific method signature, it knows that I'm doing a, a, like a confidential app or a, a, a with, with uh, credentials uh, that are not username and password. So let's quickly run this. Uh, you all know it's going to fail because I left my comments there. Select F8. Uh-oh, and also my secret is now on the, on the screen. So everyone quick, take a photo and do some terrible things. Um, so, hey, can I process argument on transform parameter client secret? So, I mean, I could have solved this by looking at what a uh, client secret actually is. It is a secure string. So you need secure strings. So the reason that I made this fail intentionally is just to show you that, again, everything that I'm doing here is making my job easier so that I don't have to think about this stuff. It's going to make sure that it is secure for me so that I can do dumb things. And it'll say, no, 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 you did a dumb thing. Be better. So, okay, let's be better. Let's put in the thing. Let's see if, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Isn't it good? Oh, Copilot is uh, quite possibly one of the best things uh, that is, uh, that's uh, for this. Okay, so I'm just going to run this again. F8. Boom. Let's have a quick look. Excellent. All right. So I've now got my access token. Note that I don't have an ID token because I did not do an interactive uh, request. I'm using a client secret. So this is a uh, application-based authentication as, as opposed to a delegate. Show of hands, everyone knows the difference between a delegate and an application auth request. Almost everyone. D does anyone want to see the difference? Okay, let's do it. Um, all right, so first things first, let me open a browser. 
I've got one here. Okay. Nope. Not that one. Uh, portal. Let's see if I can sign in. Don't make me do an auth dance while I'm talking about authentication. Is everyone asleep? We're having fun? Wow, that's small. So the question was, no, I'm not going to repeat that. Very good. Very good. All right, let's go into app registrations. Let's see what I got here. Owned applications. Uh, where are we? PSConf, I think. 2023. Awesome. Good naming. Okay, uh, I'm just going to quickly go in and show the difference uh, for, the, for the people that wanted to see. So, uh, you know, creating this uh, app registration is, you know, I absolutely boilerplate. I'm, I'm not doing anything really all, all that fancy with this. Um, I'm just creating a public application. Um, I've got a couple of um, secrets and uh, I don't have certificates. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but the one key thing is we go into API permissions, which is, hey, what am I going to do once I actually get a token with this app? Um, we can look here and I've got application and delegated, uh, delegate uh, permissions. Essentially, this boils down to how you authenticate. If you do an interactive authentication, you get the delegate application registration or the, sorry, the API permissions. If you authenticate as an application, you get the application permissions. Uh, they are slightly different. Uh, the, the basic premise is that one thing is for your automated tasks and one thing is for specifically what you can do. So when you're creating app registrations in your company's uh, org, you can go and create delegate permissions as long as you want. Because uh, if you don't have permission to do that work, it's, you know, you can't, you could get a token, but you can't do anything with it. Where an application, if you give it the permissions, it can do the thing. So one of the key things here is uh, that everything is green and ticked. It said granted for PowerCell. If I go in and add a permission right now, and we go into Microsoft Graph, and we go, so again, see so we've got delegate. So your application needs to access the API as a signed in user, or um, we're going to use a daemon or without a signed in user, so non-interactive. If I go into application permissions, we'll just have a look um, at one of the really dangerous ones. Uh, device management. So device management apps, read, write all. If I tick this, add permission. So uh, up the top here, we've got you are editing permissions to your applications. Users will have to consent even if they've also done previously. A whole bunch of different things around this. Uh, but the, the one thing I wanted to show you is just here, um, and apologies, it's in dark mode. I didn't Pay attention. Uh, not granted for PowerCell. So that essentially means that I can't use this uh, permission in my application or my, my automated task until I grant permission. To grant permission to these sort of things, because they are very dangerous, right? You, you're essentially opening up access to your environments. Uh, you need to be... Uh, you need to have quite a high role in Azure. Uh, you need to be uh, the, the tenant owner or a GA or things like that. So, you know, this is to make sure that you are ready and you know what you're actually doing, what the implications are of adding these permissions to these apps. Uh, you can set them up, but you then need to get approval to do it. So hopefully no one is just uh, you know, going into Azure with just straight up GA permissions. We're all using PIM. Again, it's 2023. We should never be signing in as our GA account or our break glass account, which I saw recently. Um, so you know, this is here again to protect you from doing silly things. Um, for me, I'm, I'm fine with this. I'm going to add up. I'm going to grant that consent because I am a GA because everything I said, I don't do myself. It's a, it's a demo tenant. Okay. So we're granting the consent in progress. We're just basically waiting for the uh, API to return back a positive. And we can see now I've got a sea of green. So I can now do whatever I needed to do with that permission. Uh, the next time I authenticate, that uh, permission is going to be available for me in the next access token that I request. Make sense? Excellent. All right. Let's go back to what I was actually supposed to be doing. Um, okay. So we are going back, not into Remote Desktop Manager. Here. Okay. Uh, I just want to do this full screen because it's kind of cool. Okay. Device code authentication. So we now know how to do interactive auth. We now know how to do a system-based thing. So our little script that I don't know, deletes all of our computers at uh, 5 p.m. on a Friday um, on the last day of our uh, job. 
that's automatically going to run happy days. How do we do things in environments where uh, we don't have access to a keyboard or the device doesn't have a keyboard or we want to authenticate to Azure on our fridge? Yes. Come on, I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, so essentially, this concept comes up uh, in terminal environments that uh, you don't interactively have access to open a browser to uh, gain access to get that token. Now, obviously, you could totally just do uh, an app registration with a client secret because you don't need to go out to the internet to do that, uh, you know, type on, type on a keyboard. But there are scenarios where you need that uh, delegate token to do the work that you're trying to do. So this is where device code authentication comes into play. Um, so let's go in and have a look at how we do this. Essentially, what's going to happen is it is going to say, okay, there's a request for interactive authentication. Uh, please type this code in on anything with a keyboard, and then we'll authenticate for you and send that back to the, the fridge that you're trying to get access to. Um, so let's have a look and see how that works. Nope, go away. Let's scroll up. Love it. It's all in order. That's great. I had another one that I'll show you in a second as well. This is very uh, slapdash. Okay, so device code authentication. Again, very, very simple because the MCL PS module is, is brilliant. We are doing client ID, tenant ID. We don't have interactive set to true. We have device code set to true. So what we're doing is we're crafting this method signature that goes into the, uh, the MCL DLLs and goes, okay, we're doing a device code flow. Uh, all of this can be done if you know the, the actual URLs to do it all. But again, don't do that. It's why waste the time. Um, so let's go through and just see what this does. I didn't leave a comment to remind me that it's broken, but I'm pretty sure it is on purpose. So let's do this. OK, let's see what happens. So down the bottom, for people that can't see, to sign in, use a web browser to open the page, microsoft.com slash device login, or aka.ms forward slash device login, I think. Don't quote me on that. Uh, and then we just need to enter this code. So this is a fairly common scenario. Uh, I, I use fridge because I found the GIF and I thought it was really, really funny. So shame on everyone who didn't laugh. Uh, but the most common scenario for this is when you are trying to sign in on an app on your TV. Uh, you don't have a keyboard, some of us. Uh, so you, know, you generally get this big screen saying, hey, go to this website, put this code in on your phone that you always have on you. And then this gets you access to you know, sort of authenticate to that app. So this is the experience that we've got. So I have a keyboard on this device, so it's kind of silly to do it this way. But let's grab this, copy, command, click. This takes us to our process. So uh, again, this just looks like an authentication dance, which it is. I'm going to enter that code. And then it takes me through to the authentication dance. So it's essentially matched me with uh, what I'm actually trying to do. And it's now going to do the authentication dance. And it's going to send it back to the device that is sitting there waiting for the request to come back. So I go in and say, Bennett Powers Hell, are you trying to sign in to PS Confi U 2023? I think this is really cool. Uh, for scenarios where you could actually have an application that sends that, uh, that little string saying, hey, you've got a code and you've got a thing, you could potentially craft that and try and be malicious and send it to someone's phone, right? And if you just keep hammering them, they're probably going to be like, I guess I'm trying to sign in. You grab the thing and click on this. This will tell you what you're actually trying to sign into. So if you do get that malicious text and you go, hang on, I'm trying to sign into obvious virus, uh, you know, 2023, then you're not going to continue any further. So this is a sanity thing that was introduced probably within the last, I want to say year, year and a half, um, just to really solidify the fact that, hey, I know what I'm trying to authenticate to. So I'm going to say continue. And it didn't fail, so I must have uh, saved myself. Uh, I did have a scenario um, I can potentially show you. Uh, one thing to get this working, because it doesn't work by default on an app registration if you don't specifically set it up to work this way, uh, if I go into my authentication, so I've set this up as a mobile and desktop application. And I have, interesting, said no. I think it's, okay, I think I know what it is. It doesn't matter. The, the real demo is that you have to say yes to this. Note down here, 
no keyboard, device code flow or SSO or app collects plain text password. Again, that ROPC. So I've done something strange with this and it's just working, which whatever, let's, let's move on. Uh, but functionally, you need to just make sure that you do have uh, public client flows uh, and don't do demos in your uh, dev tenant that is broken. Um, so yes, you need to make sure you've got public client flow for this sort of thing um, because you're essentially uh, sending out a request into the world and you need to specifically say, well, my app is going to watch for these and then it's going to go through and do the, do the needful. Um, I'm just going to save that because it should be like that. Okay, so that is how we do device auth on a fridge. How am I going for time? 13 minutes. Oh boy, okay. Let's go really quick. Ugh. Play from current slide. All right, no one likes the joke. It's good. Let's move on. Non-interactive authentication. We've gone through this. Stop being paid to press buttons and make your computers work for you. Uh, let's do this. But sometimes we like pressing buttons. We shouldn't, but we do. Uh, the example that I had for this essentially builds around the same concept as uh, we sort of saw with that non-interactive nonsense. Sorry, my ear's falling off. Uh, what I can show you is, so one of these, one of these things is you use non-interactive authentication for services that you need to run in the background, things like your daemons, things like Azure functions, which I have a session on tomorrow, which everyone's going to go to, right? Yes. Cool. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> non-interactive authentication allows you to do these things without you physically being at the keyboard. The point here is you've got these processes that need to be done if you're still manually you know, clicking a button to have, you know, uh, do a review of all the devices in your environment, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your business's time. It's fine to waste your business's time, right? But sometimes if you can optimize what you do, then you get to work on better things. And this is what hopefully I, you know, I'm gonna keep saying this until it gets drilled into everyone's head. Um, so I'm not gonna go into the demo for that, um, but I've got a cool one I can show you later. Uh, so the next one is, okay, so we have just done uh, non-interactive with a client secret. We've done uh, all the bad ways to authenticate. Client secret auth is absolutely probably the most standard thing that uh, anyone will ever do uh, when they're doing automation. The problem becomes when you're writing cool uh, uh, optimization scripts or uh, automation scripts uh, and you're storing it all in GitHub or Azure DevOps, um, you're just like, this is the best thing in the world. It's 5 p.m. on a Friday. I'm gonna commit this change and I'm gonna you know, get it chipped out. You stored the client secret in the source code, and now it's there forever. This happens all the time. The solution is to not use client secrets. It is to use certificate-based authentication. Now, a hush falls over the scene. Everyone hates certificates. Why? Because the only time we ever work with certificates is when they've expired and someone is screaming at you. Yeah? It's true. Certificates aren't actually that hard. It's just that we forget. It just atrophies out of our brain because we only need to work with them when they're expired. So don't be scared of certificates. They're really cool. I'm just going to quickly check. I've got 10 minutes. Let me show you the code for this. I'm on a Mac, so generating certificates is uh, not Microsoft friendly. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, certificate demo. Sounds like what I need. Okay, I'm just going to run this. F8. Okay, now I have a uh, certificate that I have already created. It's just self-signed. No one knows how to do self-signed certificates. We can talk about this after. Um, and I just want to use that certificate to authenticate into my environment. Now, in my app registration, I do not have the certificate set up. Thank you, Brain, for reminding me. Let's go over here. Let's go into certificates and secrets. Also, when you ship the client secret into your environment and it's, it's there in source code for the rest of time, it's all good. Just delete this secret, regenerate it again and never do it again. Or certificates. Let's go in here. Upload certificate. Uh, here. PSConf. MSL. Demo code. I think it wants this. Okay, so I'm just shipping the public uh, certificate, so not the private one. Obviously, that stays on your machine. Uh, but we just need to, uh, you know, have the, the key pair matching here, basically. Uh, cool. I'm running out of time. Let's go into add. Okay, so we've got this. We've got our thumbprint. We primarily just need to know what the thumbprint is, and we need to have the private key uh, certificate installed in our machine. Uh, we essentially match the thumb with the private key, and we get authentication. And then you never put the 
public or the, the public and private certificates in your repo, right? Or you put passwords on them. So even if people get them, you can't do anything. So cool. Okay, so now I've got this. Let's go to this one. Okay. I think this is going to work. Okay, cool. Very, very secure uh, certificate I've got here. Uh, P at. Everyone's uh, loving that. Okay, so we're just going to say, I need to grab the, um, the PFX certificate just using this module or commandlet. It's there. Now, again, msal.ps, uh, client ID, tenant ID, and that final thing, you're pretty much only ever going to be changing one parameter. It's client certificate. So I'm just grabbing the entire certificate. I'm just throwing it in there. I'm going to do this. F8. No errors means it works. Maybe. Let me just draw this out. Auth token. Sweet. Happy days. I've got my access token. So I've now changed, uh, I've increased my security posture on this app that I'm building for my company. Uh, and I've basically removed that scenario where uh, idiot brain forgets to remove the client secret because it's happened to everyone and it will continue to happen. This is why Microsoft recommends that you use client certificate authentication for everything. The next thing that we need to do, because I'm absolutely running out of time and I really apologize, um, is what is, the what is the next best thing from client uh, uh, certificate-based authentication? It's to not put any credentials anywhere. If you don't know about what those credentials are, there's no chance that you're going to leak them. So this is where we go into managed identities and authentication. I'm going to do this really quickly. Uh, I think I have a demo of how we can do this, um, but otherwise I'm going to do a lot more of this in the session tomorrow. So, okay, galaxy brain time. It's so cool. Let's get out of here. Okay, I have in Azure a function app, I think. It's been a minute. PSConf. Ah, thank you. Typo. Okay, let's go into auth demo. Everyone can see, should I change out of dark mode? Let's quickly do this. Function app, auth demo, thank you. Okay, so in my function app, again, we're not gonna go into too much around what this is. Uh, for almost all resources and things that you can build in Azure, if you scroll down, you should be able to see in the settings, this thing called an identity. Identity allows you to create two different kinds of managed identities. Does anyone not know what managed identities are? Show of hands. Okay, cool. Not that many, which is awesome. A managed identity is like a uh, service principal account, uh, but you never need to know what the password or the credential is. You just use it in Azure specifically. You can't use this on your machine. There are ways to do it. Don't. They're bad. Um, but essentially, when you're doing things in Azure, you create the, uh, the, the managed identity and what it does is whenever you need to do a thing, that identity and that, uh, that uh, scope and permission of what it's allowed to do is just always there so that when you do the things, you're already authenticated and you never need to think about it. It exists for the entire lifetime of that resource or that application. So if you delete the app, the managed identity disappears. Uh, it is all certificate-based auth because, again, that is the thing. I'm just going to hit on and save on this because sometimes it can take a while. Uh, and that certificate gets renewed in the background automatically, so you never need to worry about it. You're never going to store the credentials in your source code. You're never going to do anything. So if you are doing things in Azure today and you are not using managed identities, change what you're doing. Um, the thing I'm going to do tomorrow, uh, we're just going to build a very basic to-do app, but you can absolutely follow along and just see how I use managed identities to authenticate. Um, I have an example of a script here that we can look at. How am I going for time? Ooh, I got four minutes for questions. Hopefully everyone's got a million of them. Okay, let's have a look here. Uh, no, I've got it in AZ function auth. Okay, so again, uh, because we're running out of time, I have a way that I, this is just like a block of code that I use for all um, Azure functions that I'm using uh, specifically to work with graph. So. There's an environment variable that exists when you build an Azure function uh, using PowerShell called env msi secret. 
Um, so if that exists in the environment, hey, I've got a managed identity. I don't need to do a thing. So I'm just going to grab the token that already exists. So get AZ access token, and I'm just going to swap it out for graph. So this is how I can authenticate without putting a password in. If I'm developing the service locally, I don't have that environment variable. So I need to create a service principle with a, either a client secret or a certificate so that I can develop locally. But when I push this into production, it's always got that MSI um, secret value there. So I just use that. I never need to think about it. If, and if you're concerned about the security implications of doing this two-tiered thing, have the else statement in your local dev, and when you're ready to go, ship it up. Hopefully, you've got a pipeline or something that can just rip that out, and then you just send it off. So this is how you can sort of develop this stuff locally, but this gives you... It, it's just incredible. You never need to think about the credential. You're never going to leak it because you don't know what it is, and that's exactly how these things should work. Okay. I think, chaotically... I might actually be done. Okay, I'm going to do this, and then we're going to have questions. And if we run over, then just come and hang out at our booth. Uh, play from current slide. Let's do this. Okay. Summary. Hopefully, authentication isn't really that hard. I hope I've really explained to you that there are tools out there that make this process really easy. Everything that you know used to take us hours to figure out how we're going to register you know, an application and how we're going to authenticate to it and... Should we be using ADEL or MSL? It's always MSL. Uh, that's gone away. So we just we have these tools that make it really simple. Um, if there's any, you know, if people really want to know more about this stuff, please come and see me because I'd love to keep talking about this. Um, so you're already using MFA, so we don't need to remind you about that. It stops you from doing silly things. Certificates aren't scary, as I said. We're just scared of them because of our boss screaming at us. Um, so use them for your production workloads when you can. So if you're doing things that are not directly in Azure and you need to authenticate, you can use client secrets. That's fine. But if you want to make sure that you don't accidentally leak uh, keys to your, uh, to your kingdom, use certificates because it just it adds that extra barrier. Um, managed identities are cooler than certificates. If you can, use them. If you're using uh, Azure runbooks, uh, automation runbooks, or Azure functions, things like the, of that nature, create a managed identity. Use it that way. You never need to worry about this sort of stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and then finally, PowerShell makes all of this comically simple. Um, you're at a PowerShell conference. You're already using this. But if you're not, learn PowerShell. Love it. Use it all the time. It makes all of this possible, and it makes my job so much easier. Okay, that's it. I have one minute and 30 seconds. Question. Can I use managed identities with an on-prem application? So the question was, can I use managed identities with an on-prem application? Short answer, no. Um, it is an identity that lets you do things to resources that exist in Azure. Now, there are ways that you can do it. You can, uh, if you've heard of Azure Arc, there are ways that you can sort of tangentially connect devices that aren't in Azure to Azure. So then you can use managed identities to sort of get out that way. It's complicated. It's getting more and more. So initially when I've, because I've done this session a couple of times, and uh, the first time I said, just don't do it, it's terrible. There's actually good use cases for it, and it's quite secure. So short answer is no, you'll probably use... Uh, uh, certificates or secrets for that sort of stuff. But generally, when you're thinking about that sort of thing, if it's an on-prem uh, device or application or whatever, uh, you're only authenticating to get things from Azure. So you know, if the on-prem solution does need to do that, just use the certificate. It makes it a lot easier. The best way is to use certificate. Absolutely. So just bringing it home, use the certificate. And, uh, we have 30 seconds. Any other questions? Uh, I don't... Can you explain the question again, please? Yep. Is there any way to go around Okay, I think I know the question. So the question was, is there any way to go around MFA with an SPN? So the SPN generally doesn't have MFA. SPNs do not have delegated permissions. When you authenticate with an SPN you are generally authenticating with a client secret or a certificate. When you authenticate with those things, you get application permissions. Yeah, no, absolutely. But you will never get delegate permissions uh, when you authenticate with an SPN. You just, you just won't. There is not a password. You can't interactively authenticate to an SPN. The flow is completely different. Yes. 
Correct. Okay, so I think the question is, is there a way to get around MFA? Don't get around MFA. It's there to stop you doing silly things. We can, we can talk about... Yes, very good. Don't do bad things. Uh, okay, I'm running over. Can we do one more question? Anyone? Nothing? Go for it. I sometimes use scoping when I uh, try to limit the uh, access to other mailboxes, for example. Sure. Uh, so the question was, can I use scoping to limit access to things? So uh, just in the experience that I have, which is predominantly Intune and things of that nature, yes. Uh, yes, okay. So thank you from the back. Things that have scoping on them, like, uh, like SharePoint or Intune or Outlook and maybe Outlook, uh, you can absolutely, you set that up there, and then when you try to authenticate to do things, if you're, uh, and again, this is just for interactive auth, if you're not scoped to see that stuff, then you won't see the result. So short answer is yes. Very specifically, like you do it on a per-site basis in the scoping of the stuff, the naming stuff. If the allocation, some end applications implement it, but not everything. That's the short answer. Excellent. Sites.select for all the people watching at home. Uh, it d does scoping for SharePoint. Let's not talk about SharePoint. That's a horrifying thing. Okay, hey. <laughs> Just quickly, two, two more things. Take a photo of that. Go read that. Emmanuel wrote it. He's better than me. He's smarter than me. This is incredible. Second thing, I'm sure some people came here thinking I was going to throw shirts out. I'm giving away t-shirts tomorrow at lunch at the Patch My PC booth. So come and see my session and then go to the booth and then I'll give you out t-shirts. I have 50 and there's 300 odd people here. So some people are going to miss out. So crowd, but just be aware that you might not get them. You can trade shirts for beer right here. It works very well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.